Come on, children. Gather around closer to the fire. Old Grandpa has a story to tell you. It's okay, kiddos. Go sit over by Grandpa. He's going to tell you a fun little Halloween story. Ah, there you go. Billy, why don't you sit right here next to me on this here stump? And Mary, plop yourself down on my knee. Nothing to be afraid of, children. Fire never hurt anyone. Uh, Dad, I'm not sure you should be telling a six and four-year-old that fire is perfectly safe. Oh, fiddle-faddle. When I was a youngster, we used to start fires in the street and play stickball with them. Built character. Put some hair on your chest. Besides, I used to let you play around open flames all the time when you were their age, and nothing ever happened to you. I'm just saying that... Wait, you did what? Hush now. Now's not the time to be harping on fire safety. Now's the time for the children to hear the scariest story they've ever heard in their lives. This story is guaranteed to have you both shitting in your pants and crying into your mama's titties. Dad, watch the language. Oh, fucker doodles. I wouldn't say anything to these children that I wouldn't say in church. Now then, where was I? Oh yes, the shitting in your pants and crying into titties part. This story is extra scary because it's completely real. Everything you're about to hear actually happened, even the part about the ghosts. Especially the parts about the ghosts. Those definitely happened. Oh god, no, it's okay, Billy. There's no such thing as ghosts. Grandpa is just kidding. It's just a story. No, I'm not. Don't lie to the children, Wendy. I'm Susan, Dad. Wendy lives in Wisconsin and doesn't have kids. What? Really? Hold on. Let me get a better look at you. Oh my god. It is you, Susan. You put on some serious weight, girl. Especially in that back area. Now stop interrupting me. Billy? Martine? <sighs> Mary. Yeah, whatever. Billy and Marigold, you listen to your dear old grandfather now. Ghosts are absolutely real. They're all over the place. Hell, you probably got at least a couple of them hiding under your beds. Why, I have an entire dead Spanish soccer team haunting my linen closet. They keep howling and rattling their chains and making everything around that closet as cold as ice. Dad, we've been over this. You're just hearing the air conditioner running. There's a vent right next to the closet. I said shush, you. It's a dead Spanish soccer team, or my name isn't... It isn't... Uh, moving on. Our story takes place at the end of World War II. That was the big one, you know. The one to end all other wars. It was also the only war ever fought in the history of the world. The only damn war. I was sure they tried sticking to two on the end of it, make it seem like this was something that happened all the time. But the truth of the matter is, that's the first time there ever was a real war. There had never been a single war before that. Jesus Christ. I know what you're about to say. You're about to say, but Grandpa, what about the Revolutionary War? It's even got war right in the name. Well, you have to understand that language was different back then, and the word war meant something different. Back then, it meant that two people went out back behind a barn and hit each other with sacks of flour until one of them gave up. That's how this great country of ours won its freedom. Good old Ben Franklin beat the shit out of King George with a sack of flour till that wig-wearing jackass called it quits. But our story takes place in the real war, the First World War, World War II. Let me set the stage for you kids. The evil Axis has been conquering a large part of the world, and the Allies have just started taking back territory. This push started with D-Day, which was military shorthand for, damn, we knocked the dicks off those dickheads day. They were going to call it Triple D-Day to better reflect that, but the higher-ups thought that sounded, well, a little inappropriate. Which it absolutely is. You know, because it kind of sounded like bazongas. After we kicked the shit out of those goose-stepping assholes, they retreated out of France. Do you two know what France is? It's kind of like here, but it smells strange and there's a drunk mime on every corner. While most of the good guys went after the Nazis, some of them stayed behind to help the French people put their country back together. See, the French weren't capable of doing that themselves. They were all pretty damn helpless. Two of those soldiers were Corporal Peter Lewis and Private First Class Mark Johnston. One day, they were assigned the task of delivering supplies to a small town in the French countryside. 
wait a minute. They were driving along, minding their own business, when boom! The truck they were driving in hits a landmine. Do you kids know what a landmine is? It's like a big firecracker that blows you to kingdom come if you touch it. I've got one that can show you later if you want. Still works too. You two can throw it around in the backyard like a frisbee. So the truck hit the mine, and then it was all like, bam, boom, screech, crunch. Luckily for them, some people saw what happened and took them to a big mansion that was being used as a hospital. Lewis was going to be okay, but Johnston, well, Johnston was in a lot worse shape. Dad, I really don't think they're old enough for Mr. Gangly Walks the Halls. Mr. Gangly Walks the Halls? This isn't fucking Mr. Gangly Walks the Halls. Sure it is. It's the exact same setup as that story. That's just a coincidence. A complete coincidence. This is a completely new story that I just came up with myself. Come on, Dad. The character names are even the same. It's not fucking Mr. Gangly Walks the Halls. Now be quiet and stop interrupting. When Lewis wakes up in his bed, he's being tended to by a beautiful nurse named Ruth. She takes care of him all day and is happy and friendly and everything else you could hope a nurse to be. When it starts to get dark, though, she tells Lewis that he needs to stay in bed and not get out for any reason. When he asks her why, she leans in close and whispers, Mr. Gangly walks the halls. No, that's not what she said at all. She said something completely different. And what was that? She said, uh, she said... Well, she didn't say anything, actually. She just made that ps 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 sound that you make when you fake whisper, and then she left. It was all very confusing for Lewis. She made random whispering sounds and just left? Yes, that's exactly what happened. Now, don't you feel stupid. It's totally different. In Mr. Gangley, she said something, and in this one, she didn't. Because they're different stories, you see. So Lewis decides to get some sleep to help with the whole, you know, getting blown up thing. He sleeps deep into the night until he suddenly jerks back awake. He doesn't know what has woken him up, but something is wrong. Suddenly, there's a creeping noise from the far end of the room. As he strains his eyes in the dark to see what's happening, the door leading out into the hallway starts to slowly open. It opens more and more until it stops. As Lewis watches... A horrible, terrifying creature steps into the room. Let me guess. Very tall, very thin, wearing a cloak, speaks with a German accent, is named Mr. Gangly. No, that is not what walked in. It was nothing like that at all. Uh-huh. Then what was it? It was, uh, it was a ghost. Yeah. Yeah ghost. A spooky ghost. Just some ghost. No, not just some ghost. It was a special ghost. How dumb would it be if it was just some random ghost? And what made it so special? It was... It was the ghost with... Uh, the ghost with no butt? The ghost with no butt. The ghost with no butt. Is there a new medication that you're taking, or maybe one that you've had prescribed that you haven't filled yet? This has absolutely nothing to do with the dementia pills that quack told me I should be taking. The ghost with no butt is a real spooky ghost, and he was there in France, and he wasn't Mr. Gangly. Let me finish my damn story. So, there it was standing in the doorway. The ghost with no butt. Lewis had heard of the ghost with no butt, of course, since it's a very real and very famous ghost. Some would say it's the scariest ghost and most well-known ghost of all. In fact, everyone that knows anything about ghosts would say that. Uh-huh. So what's the story with the ghost with no butt? The story? Yeah, the story. How did it die? How did it wind up with no butt? Oh, um... The background isn't really important to this particular scary story. No, go on. Tell me. You say it's a very famous ghost, and I'm feeling a little foolish because I haven't heard of it before. Tell me about it. 
I mean, you do know that, right? Of course I do. The ghost with no butt was a man. And that man died. And he became a ghost. What was the man's name? It was... Arthur. Arthur. Arthur what? Arthur Scary Man. Arthur Scary Man. Yes, Arthur Scary Man. A man named Arthur Scary Man died and became a ghost. That is correct. And how did he die? He was shot by a cannon. A cannon that what? Blew off his butt? No, of course not. That'd be fucking stupid. He didn't die from his butt being blown off. He lost his butt after he became a ghost. How does a ghost lose its butt? He was... He was shot by a ghost cannon. Please tell me you're listening to yourself. No, it's true. A ghost cannon destroyed his butt. That's why he's known as the ghost with no butt. Okay. There are about a thousand different things wrong with this, but fine. I'll humor you. What exactly is a ghost cannon? It's the spirit of a cannon, of course. I would have thought that part was obvious. How does a cannon have a spirit? Pardon? Damn it, Dad! It's a cannon! A big metal thing that shoots cannonballs! It's not alive! How can it possibly have a spirit if it was never alive? Oh, well, clearly you just have no idea how the spirit world works. There are all kinds of things that can become ghosts. Things like people, and cannons, and shopping malls, and uh, railroad tracks. All kinds of shit. Yeah, so do you still have that written prescription in the house, or should I call your doctor to get a new one? I am not taking those crazy pills. I can't think straight when I'm on them. And gnomes in my kitchen don't like to be around me when I'm on them. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm trying to spend some quality time with my grandchildren. So there's Lewis, face to face with the ghost with no butt. Like I said, he knew the legend. He knows that on dark nights, when the clouds obscure the moon and wind blows through the woods, the ghost with no butt appears on a great black horse, holding a severed butt. The only way to escape him is to cross the old bridge by the burial ground. Well, now you're just ripping off the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Sorry, I can't say I've ever heard of it. Yes, you have. No, sorry, it's just not ringing any bells for me. Oh, come on. You used to read Washington Irving to me when I was a little girl. You have a copy of his essays sitting on your bookcase right this minute. Hell, you watched the Disney version with me about a thousand times. Was that the one with the Little Mermaid? You know damn well it's not the one with the Little Mermaid. Susan, darling, please, don't use that language in front of the children. They're very impressionable at this age. I know that I raised you to have more class than that. So Lewis lays in his bed, trembling and sweating bullets at the sight of the fearsome and definitely real ghost with no butt. He just knows that the horrifying specter is coming to separate him from his precious derriere. It's a fine derriere, too. He has won many blue ribbons at fairs and festivals with it. To his surprise, however, the ghost with no butt ignores him in his bed and goes over to Johnston's bed instead. Lewis wants to cry out to warn his friend and stalwart companion about the danger that his lower cheeks are facing, but there's also a part of him that's a little insulted. He's quite sure that his ass is the finer of the two, and for the ghost with no butt to choose the inferior product, it doesn't sit well with him. He puts his rump pride to the side. The stakes are simply too big for him to be blinded by the presence of his own magnificent cracked cushion. This is Johnston, damn it. The man that had been with him in the truck when they had driven over that mine. The man who had been there during other events as well, I sure. It was Johnston, damn it. Ignoring the pain, Lewis rises from his bed and stands between his unconscious friend and the vicious ghost with no butt. He points one finger at the apparition and declares, You will bring Johnston no harm. 
I will deny your quest for replacement bottom this day, and I will send you back to the pits of hell. Lewis has a secret, you see. He was a champion Golden Glove boxer. Raising his mighty hands, he engages the ghost with no butt in a deadly challenge of old-timey fisticuffs. He's boxing the ghost? I know. Very few people would have had the courage and conviction to do so. But Lewis is made of sterner stuff than other men. He must have been if he was able to punch a ghost. Lewis and the ghost with no butt would go on to wage a mighty battle that night. The mansion shook as they exchanged blows. There were two titans rocking the earth, and everything trembled before them. A few times, it looked like the ghost with no butt had the upper hand. Each time, though, Lewis used his guile to escape and mount his offense anew. They stayed locked in mortal combat for hours. Eventually, although Lewis was the more skilled fighter and had the advantage of being attached to a set of hindquarters, the ghost with no butt prevailed. Lewis had been exhausted by the fight, and not having any lungs, the ghost with no butt was incapable of becoming winded. Also, the ghost with no butt cheated, because everyone knows ghosts are cheating little bitches. Having been knocked off his feet, Lewis was forced to accept his fate. He had been defeated, and now the ghost of no butt was going to claim his prize. He wondered if he would see his ass again after he died. Would it be waiting for him on the other side, standing in golden fields and welcoming him with open cheeks? He smiled at the thought. That was a pleasant thought. Him and his pooper, together for all eternity. The ghost of no butt bore down on him, and he closed his eyes before smiling to himself. A wonderful thought indeed. There was a loud clanging noise, and Lewis opened his eyes. He felt a wave of relief wash over him. Johnston, best of friends and runner-up of Tukas contests, had come out of his coma and smashed the ghost with no butt over the head with his bedpan. The ghost with no butt staggered backward, and as if in slow motion, it fell. For most people... Such a short fall would only be painful, or perhaps produce a slight injury. The ghost with no butt, however, had no soft yet firm posterior to stop its fall. It cried out once as its transparent body struck the hard floor. Not having anything to blunt the impact, the blow caused its entire body to explode into millions of droplets of goo. It was over. Lewis and Johnston were safe. The next day they were picked up by a military medical team and moved to Paris. The people staying at that lonely mansion in the French countryside were never again tormented by the ghost with no butt. Thank God it's over. But they still say that, to this day, if you pass gas on a lonely road when the moon is full, the ghost with no butt will come to claim your fanny. So beware, children. And always make sure that you fart in the safety of the light of day. There now, Susan. I told you this was a much different story than Mr. Ganley walks the halls. What do you think of your dear old dad now? I think I'm going to have the kids waiting in the car while I go inside, find your prescription, and force feed it to you by shoving it down your throat with my bare hands. Yes, yes, under the circumstances, I would indeed say that is the proper thing to do. Go have fun in Mommy's car, kids. Grandpa's going to go get heavily medicated. Thanks for coming by, and remember, watch your tiny little asses.